<clears throat> Good morning, everybody. I'm Matthew Burke. I'm one of the partners here at Sereni and Associates, uh, taking part in the NFP update today. Uh, I'll be talking through some accounting updates that we've seen over the past few years and things that are coming down the pike that may be relevant to you as nonprofit organizations or people working in the nonprofit field. I like this screen view, so forgive me that it's not full screen, but we can kind of see what's coming next uh, on the left margin there, too. There's a lot to talk about. I'm not sure we'll get through it all. I'll probably rush through the last few uh, ASUs that are on here. Uh, some are repeats from past years just because we're seeing that they're not still being applied properly or completely by a lot of the organizations we work with. So we assume uh, the, the industry at large is not doing it. Uh, also, some things that are not as important that we can probably gloss over a little bit more quickly. And I've tried to order these in importance <clears throat> and relevancy in terms of what we're seeing in the the day-to-day -day lives that we have as auditors working with hundreds of nonprofit organizations each year. So here's the general uh, gist of it. Uh, we're going to start by talking about contributions revenue, which is, is not necessarily a new change, but it's something that we're noticing uh, very frequently is not being properly applied. So we're going to focus on that first because I think it's most important and it's most relevant for everybody and might be the most educational for everybody too. Then we'll talk about some technical agenda items that the FASB has uh, over the horizon, things that might be coming down in the next couple of years that would affect you. Uh, the 2024 yellow book, which applies to federal funds that are re received and expended. Uh, we'll talk very quickly about COVID-19 funding because we are finally, thankfully, coming out of the COVID woods. Uh, there is still some provider relief funds hanging out there, but really not a lot, and it probably doesn't apply to most of you. We'll talk about some auditing standards. That's what the SAS is, statements on auditing standards. Uh, and then we'll get into a, a new accounting pronouncement that's become effective pretty much in the past year that we've seen affecting organizations. It's CECL, uh, it's accounting for credit losses. And then from there, we'll go into cloud computing arrangements. We'll touch back on leases, which is a couple of years old now, but still complicated, still annoying, still something that I think is useful to talk about. And then we'll close with a few that may or may not affect most of you. Um, intangibles about goodwill, accounting for goodwill. DB plan disclosure requirements, and then the sunsetting of the LIBOR rate and how that can be affecting any of you out there. Uh, so we have uh, a Q&A and a chat going. I have one of my um, associates with me, Crystal Harvey. She's a supervisor in our audit department working with mostly nonprofits. She will try to keep up on the Q&A as I go. And if we don't get to something on the Q&A, we'll have your information and we'll reach out to you after the presentation to make sure we are addressing whatever concerns you may have. So with that, we'll get right into it. Rules for recognizing contributions. This all started with Accounting Standards Update 2018-08, issued by the Financial Accounting Standards Board. So we have acronyms in here. An ASU is an update to the accounting regulations. FASB, FASB, is the Accounting Regulation Standard Center. It's a nonprofit board that meets and convenes and talks about these things and comes out with all these new wonderful rules that we have to interpret. So the whole point of this was the FASB noticed that there was diversity in practice in how contributions were being accounted for by nonprofit organizations. They issued this ASU in hopes of clarifying things and making it easier to apply and more universally accepted and presented to the outside world. Of course, every time the FASB does this, they really just muck things up a bit more uh, than it was before, and they open up new areas for interpretation, new com complexities, new issues and concerns for organizations to apply. So the, the point here is that many nonprofits still are unaware that this even came out and may be accounting for contributions incorrectly. Uh, so the new guidance really coincided with new revenue recognition rules that came out around the same time. So revenue recognition and contribution recognition are two separate things. I know all of you look at contributions as your revenue, and it really is in a technical sense. But from an accounting standpoint, we're going to carve those two issues out and name them something different, contributions and revenue recognition. So the reason why I'm making this clear here is that the new guidance clarifies the definition of contribution and distinguishes it from exchange, transa exchange transactions, which is revenue recognition. Uh, it also added a new element here, and that's the a term conditional or unconditional. Uh, so contributions have to be determined whether or not they're conditional or unconditional now. That was something that didn't really exist as an accounting concept before this ASU. And that's where a lot of the interpretation has come into play and a lot of the disagreements and, and uh, challenges that we've had in interpreting this new ASU. So contributions are defined as unconditional transfers of cash or other assets. 
uh, does not require the recipient to provide anything of value to the donor in return. So donor is giving you money or pledging money to you. Donor is not really asking for anything in return that benefits the donor in a sense. Uh, on the other hand, though, an exchange is a reciprocal transfer, meaning it goes both ways, in which each party pursuant to the contract or transaction receives and sacrifices approximately commensurate value. So donor gives contribution to you, doesn't ask for anything in return. In an exchange, someone gives you money in return for a service or something like that. They're getting something out of it too. Uh, in an exchange, both parties agree on the amount of assets transferred in exchange for goods and services usually. So the, the main distinction is if you're getting money from an organization, a company, a person, is it a contribution or is it an exchange transaction? That's the first thing that you have to start with and determine. So this new ASU provides indicators to distinguish between those two because it's so important and dictates how it will be accounted for. So the intent, the provider discretion, uh, penalties that may as be assessed by the, the provider of the funds affect this classification. Um, some transactions may include both a contribution and an exchange component, but really if you think about it, um, it all comes back to whether or not the, the donor or the giver of the funds is getting anything in return. So you as nonprofit organizations, you receive contributions. Those are pretty clear usually, um, but you have other services that you provide. It could be medical services. It could be educational services. Uh, it could be seminars. It could be fundraising events where um, you know there, there's sponsorships and things like that. All of that, there's sort of an exchange. You know, Whoever's giving you the funds is getting something in return for that. And that means that it comes away from the contributions accounting guidance and regulations and goes into revenue recognition, which is separate, which I'm not talking about today. Just want to focus on contributions here. So the intent to exchange resources indicates an exchange. Uh, so the provider would have full discretion in determining the amount of transferred assets there. Uh, if a provider does not receive commensurate value, I'm sorry, a provider does not receive commensurate value in transferring funds for public benefit. So we've seen in the past that government grants where let's say it's a, it's a budget-based grant, um, a grants or a government agency is giving you uh, funds and you're implementing a grant program, spending it according to the budget. And you may say, well, the, the general public or the, the government itself may be deriving a benefit from that uh, contract that you have with them, the grant contract, because you're providing a service that the government would otherwise provide, or you're just benefiting the society in general, which is something that the government has to do. This ASU clearly states that that does not count as commensurate value. Uh, a transaction like that, a grant like that would actually be considered a contribution, not an exchange transaction subject to the revenue recognition rules. You can see this gets muddy and it gets complicated. Uh, so penalties assessed on the recipient may affect the classification of a transaction. So penalties limited to delivery of assets or return of unspent amounts indicate, indicate a contribution. Uh, penalties in excess of amounts of assets transferred indicate in exchange. So if someone's giving you money and you, you don't comply with the grant or contract and you may have to return the rights or the, return the funds, that can be a contribution. If there's something punitive in there, uh, penalties in excess of the amounts you're getting, that could indicate an exchange. What this is really saying over and over again is that this is very much subject to interpretation. And what we're telling our organizations that we audit and work with is that when you're getting these types of donations or contributions or even grant contracts that are not clear, um, that's very common and it's normal and you should really be trying to interpret these rules as best you can uh, you can reach out to the donors or the, the givers of the funds to try to um, understand what their intent is to determine whether or not there's exchange or if it's a contribution and if you're working with auditors or accountants things like that run it by them or us as well because it, it is not always cut and dry is not always obvious how you have to account for these things and that's why a lot of times I hate when these ASUs and these FASB regulations come out because they really just make things worse. I think uh, in this case, it's definitely something that I think and a lot of my clients will agree it has made it worse because we're having these conversations to try to interpret something that is not so clear and it involves judgment. And a lot of times it, this ASU just hasn't helped. It's just made things more, more complicated and money. So the next bullet is very important. Uh, so. ASU 2018-08 determines what's conditional or unconditional in terms of contributions. And the distinction between conditional and unconditional affects the timing of when you record the contribution uh, in your books as a contribution. So conditional contributions, they have barriers. Uh, conditional contributions are not recognized until those barriers are met and overcome, until the conditions are met. 
On the other hand, unconditional contributions that don't have any conditions that are imposed by the donors are recognized all up front. So the, the classic example of an unconditional contribution is a, a multi-year pledge. So if someone makes a, a three-year multi-year pledge to you, let's say $100,000 a year, you're going to recognize $300,000 of contributions right away in year one when it's pledged to you because there's no other strings attached. You may have to spend it a certain way in the future, um, but it, it's, it's sort of unconditional. It's just over time. If, however, someone gives you $300,000 today and imposes all sorts of different conditions, you wouldn't recognize any of that yet until you meet those conditions. And that's why this is important. And that's what's changed. And that's what's screwing everybody up when they're trying to account for things now um, with donor imposed conditions that they didn't realize were in place in the past. So it's important to identify these conditions that and make sure that you know what they are to make sure you know when you're overcoming them and meeting them so that you can properly recognize the contribution. Uh, so right now, the definition of, con of conditions is that it has to include both a barrier that has to be overcome by the organization in order, in order to earn the funds and keep them and a potential right of return or release. Basically, the donor is saying, we can take the money back if you don't meet these conditions um, or you know, we'll bill you for it or something like that. So barriers can be indicated by multiple factors, obviously, right? Um, and the other thing to note is when donors are giving you money, they're not thinking about how to account for things. They probably don't really care, right? They're making sure that they're Contracts, um, their donation agreements, their award letters are consistent with what they have to do legally, um, but they're not really aware of the financial and accounting ramifications that the language in those contracts may have on you. It's why we as auditors are now reaching out to donors more and more to really try to understand what the intent is, what the true terms and nature of contracts are, um, because it's not always obvious. And what we're finding is that what's written in the award letters and the contracts doesn't necessarily reflect reality of how the program is run and all that other stuff too. So it's very important to, to discuss these issues with the nonprofit organizations and with the donors to really understand how it all works before you make conclusions about whether or not there's conditions in place, what they are and when they can be met. So again, getting into barriers and, and things like that, uh, some performance related barriers that we see uh, could specify certain levels of service, numbers of units of output, uh, you know, units of service that have to be provided, things like that, specific outcomes that have to come about, you know, as a result of you getting the award and spending the money a certain way, matching requirements. Um, there could also be activity conduct in the next one, um, specific guidelines, expenses in lines with budgets. So most awards that you get have some sort of budget in place. Uh, and this is where more interpretation is required. If it's a very strict budget, uh, one that the donor has a lot of influence over, one where you have to report to the donor frequently about budget to actual variances, uh, when we have to ask them to slide dollars around from budget lines if things aren't being spent the way they were originally intended, if there's approvals that need to, all of that sort of suggests that it's a condition. Uh, where the, the donor really has a lot of influence over how the funds are being spent. And you really need to meet those conditions. Otherwise, they're going to take the money back, find you out of compliance and things like that. Uh, so that, again, is something to, to keep in mind. If you have a very strict budget, it should be a trigger or a flag that goes off in your head that you might have a condition and you shouldn't recognize that contribution until those conditions are met. Now, I keep saying you shouldn't recognize the contribution. I'm trying not to use the word revenue because I don't want to screw up uh, everyone's understanding. But if you get money uh, in advance of a condition being met, it just becomes a liability, a deferred revenue or, or unearned uh, contribution, something like that is how you account for that. And then as the contribution uh, condition is met, you flip that from the liability to the contribution, which would be in your income. Uh, so again, going down a little bit, reporting requirements are not considered barriers. So we get this argument from some of our clients from time to time. You know, most donors are asking for reports at different periods or intervals during the course of the contract or all at the end, basically saying how is the fund, how were the funds used, uh, what was accomplished with the grant funds and things like that. That alone does not create a condition. Um, if they're just simple reporting requirements without much teeth attached, uh, sort of just to apprise a donor of what's going on and how you spent their funds, that does not create a condition that would still be considered unconditioned. If that reporting requirement is tied in with detailed budgets and approvals and things like that, then it could all together be indicative of conditions. 
So that right of return of funds or release may be implied by nature of the agreement or might just be specifically stated. We are seeing a lot of them now specifically state that if the funds aren't used for their intended purposes, they can be recalled and they can be returned and will be to the donor. So that again is more indicative of a, a condition than it is lack of condition. Last bullet is like I said, so conditional contributions are accounted for as refundable advances or unearned contribution, some sort of liability account uh, until the conditions are met. So this says revenue here and I should change this, but contributions are recognized only when the barriers are overcome, typically to the extent the expenses have been allocated to the grant contribution, if it's budget based and things like that. Some helpful pointers here and other tidbits. Uh, definitely try to clarify the intent of the contribution with the donor. We're finding that these conversations are just starting as a result of our audits. Uh, so we're asking about contributions whose language may be ambiguous to determine whether or not there's conditions in place or if there are not conditions in place. And a lot of times we're going back and speaking with donors. I know organizations don't wanna bother their donors, right? Because they're the lifeblood of the organization. They're so valuable to you. Last thing you wanna do is burden them with more nonsense from your accountants. Uh, unfortunately, and this is the byproduct of these new regulations that come out from the FASB, um, we have to do what we can to really understand the terms of the, the contracts. Uh, if we can't speak with the donors when it's ambiguous, we're kind of forced to make a judgment that may or may not be advantageous to you or beneficial. So um, if there is uh, an ability to have this dialogue with donors, I encourage it because I think it helps iron things out and really understand. And we have a real life example of a client that we had where we uh, have a very strictly worded donation that was given, but then you speak to the donor, an actual person, you know, and get them on the Zoom or a Teams meeting, and they explain how, yes, that's what's written. It's, it's sort of legalese, but realistically, this is how the program works. And we got comfort that you know, maybe it wasn't so conditional. It just seemed to be in writing. So that other proper context, I think, is helpful. And um, when there is ambiguity, you know, you, you have the ability to interpret it in ways that make the most sense to you. It's not always cut and dry, black and white. Um, and that, that can be advantageous because you can interpret it in a way that's beneficial to you. The use of the term grant can be misleading because the accounting regulations don't define grant. You know, we use it every day. A grant can be a contribution. A grant can be a, a conditional contribution. A grant can be a revenue recognition exchange type transaction. So when you're saying the word grant, uh, it's not an accounting term. Uh, so we try to clarify in our financial statements and things like that, what the word grant really means to an organization. Does it mean contribution? Does it mean an, an exchange transaction or something like that? Because it, it's really not uh, always outlined and, and clear in the accounting literature. Unconditional contributions can also have donor imposed restrictions. And this is where it gets really annoying because con condition and restriction sort of sounds like the same thing. I didn't look it up in a dictionary, but if I were to, I'm sure the meanings would be very similar. Uh, and of course the accounting powers that be like to use these two words and, and make them dissimilar, which only complicates things further. So first you have to determine whether or not a contribution is conditional or not. After you figure that out, you have to determine whether or not the contribution is restricted or not. So it's another layer of interpretation that comes into place. So restrictions, think of them this way, they're not as intensely worded as uh, conditions. Uh, restricted contributions are recorded all up front, uh, and then their net assets are released from restriction over time as the restrictions are met, depending on what they are. So the restrictions really limit the use of a contribution to a specific purpose or time. Um, the key word there is limit. There's no barriers to overcome before you keep the funds. There's usually not a right of return and all that other stuff. So again, it's it's getting muddy and don't shoot the messenger. I'm just trying to help you all interpret these ridiculous rules as they come out. So unconditional contributions with donor imposed restrictions should be recognized as net, ass net assets without donor restrictions. But if there are donor imposed restrictions, that's when you get that sort of second column in your balance sheets, your uh, statements of financial position to show what your restricted funds are as opposed to your funds that are not restricted. Uh, so restrictions, as it says, limits the use to a specific purpose or time. Conditions really affect the entitlement that you have to the contribution. That's the distinction, which I know still feels similar. Uh, to make it even more complicated, a contribution can be both conditional and restricted. So restrictions tend to kick in after the conditions are met. So be on the lookout for that too. 
uh, really just means that you really have to pay very close attention to the verbiage in your grant slash award slash donor letters and agreements that you're getting because what's written in those and how the programs and, and uh, donations work really affects how you're counting for everything. And you can't assume it's all one way or the other anymore. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, time restrictions, as you'd expect from the, the term there, is funding to be used in future periods, usually for generally general operating expenses or specific programs. This is my multi-year pledge uh, example. So if someone's giving you a $300,000 pledge today, $100,000 payable over the next three years, uh, there's an, a sort of implicit time restriction for those future years, uh, years two and three. So you would see that as restricted for time. Or someone can give you money today and say, I don't want you to spend this until 2026. That becomes a time restriction. Restrictions for purpose are probably more common. Uh, that's when funding is to be used for a specific program. But the organization there has more control over the spending as opposed to the donor telling you how to spend it. So this is more like... Um, you know, giving you $50,000 for a capital expenditure, right, for a roof or a capital campaign or something like that. That's restricted. The donor isn't really telling you exactly how to use the money. You still get to choose the vendors and spend the right amount and all that other stuff. Um, it's just, it's it's the degree and severity of the limitation being imposed that distinguishes between a restriction and a condition. And of course, it gets blurry. So that's that's the crux of it all. That's That's the importance. And I know there's a lot just thrown at you, but the keys to remember are that there's uh, different levels of interpretation that have to take place when you're getting money from a donor uh, or anybody really. One, is it a contribution or is it an exchange transaction? Okay, if it's an exchange transaction, then we deal with that that way. We're not going to talk about that now. So if it's a contribution, is it conditional? Is it unconditional? Uh, once you determine that, is it restricted? Is it not restricted? So all these different layers of interpretation and decision making will determine how to account for these contributions. Again, bring us in, bring your accountants into the mix to make sure that you're all interpreting this together in the right way. Uh, there's also some new disclosure requirements that came into place. Nothing really too crazy here. Nothing that I, I think we need to spend time on. So now that we're done with contributions, which has been a pain point, um, we can look ahead to the future. So the FASB has a technical agenda of future thinking areas of potential changes. So these aren't changes yet, but they might be. Um, and I've outlined two that could be relevant to nonprofits. One, software costs. Uh, so software costs, there's um, pretty detailed accounting literature how, about how to account for software costs, uh, whether or not it should be considered an asset or an expense. Uh, the asset is usually for like internal use developed software or something like that, or software that's going to be licensed or sold. Uh, so because of what's going on in the technology world and so much new technology coming out about software, a lot of these rules are, are dated from like the 80s and 90s. So it needs a refresh. So that's what we're seeing here. And, and some of that may affect nonprofits because you do have cloud platforms. You are investing in technology now. It's not something that just applies to Microsoft anymore. Uh, so we'll be on the lookout for this and bring you up to speed if there's any changes there. And then government grants accounting. We're hoping that there's some more clarity here because as I mentioned, government grants can be either considered contributions or exchange revenue, usually contributions. Um, but um, as a result of COVID and the PPP loans that came out, uh, the FASB did make some clarifications there about how to account for that stuff, but never really took it a step further in terms of how to account for government grants and giving it its own section of the accounting rules. Uh, so that's something that may be happening. These things tend to take three to five years start to finish. So really, we probably won't see anything on that for quite some time, but it is out there, something to look at. New yellow book. So yellow book's a sort of antiquated term, but um, organizations that receive federal funds and expend over a certain amount each year are subject to special federal compliance audits. Uh, could be called a yellow book audit, used to be called an A133 audit, single audit, uniform guidance audit, all kind of means the same thing. Uh, but there's a new yellow book, which is the guidance about all the stuff that was outlined uh, and released in February of this year. Uh, really not a lot of changes there. Uh, it takes effect for calendar 2026, not a huge deal. Uh, they were finding that there were deficiencies in practice from auditors and audit firms that were really not performing the proper uniform guidance or single audits uh, so this is meant to clarify a lot of that and puts a lot of more onus on the auditors, which is important. Um, but really affecting providers, not, not so much. Uh, there was a compliance supplement. So every year they, they issue a compliance supplement 
um, that helps determine the compliance requirements for each of the different federal programs that are in effect. Uh, that was just released last month. There was one notable change and that was increasing the single audit requirement threshold. Uh, it used to be $750,000, still kind of is, uh, but now it's up to a million dollars. So if you're expending over a million dollars of federal funds starting in calendar 2025, you'll be subject to that special single audit for compliance and internal control, stuff like that. COVID funding, uh, we know about the provider relief funds that came out, affected a lot of healthcare agencies. You can see at the bottom of this chart here, we're really mu pretty much approaching the last uh, periods here. We haven't seen anybody that's been up to period nine, honestly. So this probably doesn't affect most of you, but it is still out there, still does trigger the uniform guidance audit, as you see here, and something to be aware of if you're still getting provider relief funds. This next one, there were some changes to standards on auditing. So you have to comply with the FASB uh, accounting standards. We have to apply for auditing, uh, sorry, comply with auditing standards from the AICPA. There were some new auditing standards that were released, some of, our, some of which are effective now, others are coming down the pike. That's up to SAS 149 now, which is a couple of years away. Really, it doesn't change the outward reporting that you'll see, which is important. You know, a couple of years ago, there was a change to the uh, auditor's opinion. There's been some changes to the required communications we have to make to you. Not so much going on there, which is good for you. You don't have to worry about this so much, except we have to worry about this, and that may create more work for you as organizations being audited. Uh, so looking at risk is always something that's important that we have to do, I guess, an even better job at now. There were some new rules about assessing the IT controls and technology. So technology is becoming more and more important every day, every second, really. So as part of your audits, you're probably going to be asked even more questions about your IT environment, whether or not there's any potential weaknesses in there, uh, opportunities for improvement and stuff like that. This is something that we've been doing for years, but industry is now catching up. Um, also more internal monitoring for audit firms and updates to standards for group audits involving consolidated entities when there's multiple audit firms involved, which is rare, but we, we take part in a couple of those. It is something that's out there. Usually if you have like a subsidiary around the world somewhere where uh, your local accountant does not have an office, you may use them as a component auditor. So these changes may affect how the conduct of those types of audits if you have them. So now to the other major accounting standards change that is now effective. This is the new one that we're starting to see. Um, practically speaking, it hasn't had a major impact on most of the organizations that we work with, um, but it is out there. It is something that is, is often unknown or people are unaware of. So we're trying to make everybody aware of that now and how it can really impact you. The, the key cute acronym here is uh, CECL, Current Expected Credit Loss Model. Really what it deals with is accounting for <clears throat> potential bad debts and allowances for doubtful accounts on accounts receivable, things like that. It's worth noting, I'll jump to it at the bottom here, this does not apply to contributions receivable. So again, contributions versus earned revenue exchange transaction. This is more exchange transaction stuff and loans that are made that sit on your books as receivables. So if you're a lending organization, affordable housing, things like that, and you have a loan portfolio, this certainly affects you probably more than any other top of, type of nonprofit organization. Really what this does, it requires that organizations account for credit losses, bad debt reserves, things like that, uh, at the, re the reporting date based on historical experience, current conditions, forecasts, and things like that. The prior standard was when you become aware of a loss of a bad debt, then you account for it. So if you know one of your funders has gone bankrupt, obviously, and they owe you money, you're not going to get that money. Uh, you pick that up as a bad debt when you become aware of that. That's the old model. The new model is a bit more aggressive and forward thinking and backward looking in that it says, okay, based on your past experience and your past history, what types of uh, bad debt losses have you had in the past? And you should probably set up a reserve, some sort of percentage based on those factors, even though you're not aware of any known losses now. That's the difference. Uh, most of you, or maybe a good portion of you are probably and have probably already been doing this because it is a more conservative approach. Um, but the days of just saying, ah, everything's collectible are, are kind of behind you. You have to at least prove it out now. You have to look at it a bit more closely to see if you have had bad debts in the past, what's caused them, what's the factors that gave rise to them, what percent of receivables or revenue are they, and should you be applying that going forward? That's really the gist of it here. What you also see is that there's new disclosures in your financial statements about your accounting policies to comply with this. Again, not a big deal for you, um, but something that your auditors will probably have to go through 
and put in there and make sure that you're compliant with. Um, so we'll go through this. Um, I, I sort of summarized it, but here's some of the factors that you should consider when estimating credit losses. So if you have borrowers, that that's this came about mostly because of financial service, financial institutions, right? And if you track that stuff, which probably most of you don't, but if you look at like JP Morgan Chase's uh, earnings reports, they talk about loan loss reserves. And it's such a big number that swings every quarter. It's it's billions of dollars this way or that way based on history and these calculations and these complicated models they have really to make sure that lending institutions were properly presenting their balance sheets and not showing their assets in an overstated fashion, right? So what happens is there's crises in the world that eventually trickle down to the small nonprofits that this doesn't really apply much to, and that's what we're facing here. But if you're a lender, um, you do have to worry about borrower's financial condition, their ability to make scheduled payments, payment terms are in place, a volume uh, and, and aging categories, things like that, collateral, uh, what your policies and procedures are, what your experience has been in the past, and maybe environmental factors. So much of this doesn't apply to you. Most of you probably are just getting funds from donors, uh, from government sources who are usually reliable, just slow in paying, right? Um, things like that. So you really factor this all in, take it with a grain of salt, though, if you're not a financial services type nonprofit, not a lender, not a community housing organization, something like that. There are disclosures that are required now, uh, how loss estimates were developed. If you have, it says um, by portfolio segment. So if you have major types of different receivables, <clears throat> excuse me, you'd have to disclose the bad debts and the, the reserves that are attributable to each one. How you're coming up with that, the risk characteristics. Again, it mostly applies to financial services, lending type organizations, not all of you with your day-to-day -day accounts receivable, contributions receivable, things like that. <clears throat> there were some clarifications after the original ASU. So if you go back, you see this one came out in 2016. And then every year thereafter, they have to clarify because they don't get it right or comprehensively enough the first time. So this one's important here too. Some of you may be lessors where you have properties that you're leasing out. Uh, receivables that come about from those leasing type of arrangements are excluded from this also, just like contributions receivable. Doesn't really count. Uh, and then this one, 2019, 1904, just again, some improvements and things like that. Really, I think that the takeaway here, more than anything, like I said, uh, the rules have changed slightly. They shouldn't have a major impact on you, but you should be performing detailed analysis of your receivables at given points in time to see if there's any that you think may go bad from known experience and estimate what might go bad that you're not aware of based on past experience. Throw that on the books as a reserve for bad debts, and you're good to go. <clears throat> we'll flip on from there. Cloud computing arrangements. This is important. This one is tricky too. So a lot of organizations are now entering to the entering into these types of cloud computing arrangements, right? I know we have we're on Microsoft 365, so everything's hosted in the cloud. You may be sitting on Azure. You may have. Salesforce, right? Software that isn't on premise. It's it's up in the sky somewhere, according to the experts in the cloud. Uh, so the costs associated with these cloud computing arrangements don't default to just recording them as expense because some of the implementation costs for these types of things could be capitalized as a, you know a, a longer term asset that gets amortized over time. And that's the point of this too. So uh, if you're enter entering entering into these types of arrangements. Just be on the lookout for different types of things that may indicate that certain costs could be capitalized. So this applies to implementation costs uh, incurred in a hosting arrangement that's a service contract where you, the customer, or we do not have possession of the software, right? It's it's hosted by somebody else, hosted by Microsoft or uh, Salesforce or whoever else has the software. Um, it could be, you know, QuickBooks Online is another example. That's a small license fee every year, not a lot of implementation involved. But um, for fancier types of software, whether it's accounting or just business in general, you may spend a lot of money to get things up and running. And that could potentially be something that's capitalizable based on the other internal use software guidance that exists. So this is one where I would say, if you have this type of situation, um, try to research it yourself, bring it to the attention of your accountant so they can help you interpret it because it is not easy. This internal use software guidance is very complicated. 
in terms of what is qualified to be um, capitalized as an asset and amortized as exposed to some as opposed to something that has to be expensed on an ongoing basis. The new lease standard, I, I hesitate to even call it new anymore, but it is something that um, is still being implemented. So that the key changes here, remember, um, past operating leases, you know, ones where you don't really take ownership or have a bargain purchase or something like that of, of the, the space usually that you're occupying or the equipment. Operating leases were always just expensed. Now, based on um, future minimum payments, interest rate discounts, you have to impute and calculate uh, a liability associated with that and a related asset that gets amortized over time. That's the gist of this one. Uh, you should all be doing this now. I know for a lot of our organizations that we worked with, we set up the original template to determine how much should be recorded as the asset and liability and sort of gave you that amortization and uh, imputation table to run with. Uh, it should be something you could do yourselves, but if you can't reach out to your accountants, we're happy to, to help with that. Um, so the lease is, is we'll go through this pretty quickly. Uh, contract of a lease is when two criteria met. Contract explicitly or implicitly specifies the use of identified asset and the customer, whoever's possessing it, controls the use of the asset for a period of use. So that's a lease. So if you have a lease, you have to adopt this um, as long as it's long term, which we'll get to. Uh, you should be past the restatement period because everything should have been done a couple of years ago already now. Um, there is still a distinction between operating leases and finance leases. They used to be called capital leases because that creates different recognition rules. So you still have to analyze whether or not these leases are something that should be considered a, a capital type lease or an operating lease as it has in the past, because there's a slight distinction in how to account and present and disclose that. Uh, so this is a key one here, term of greater than 12 months. So if you have short-term leases, you do not have to adopt ASC topic 842. That's something to note. Um, a lot of organizations are trying to go month to month with certain things just to avoid this. Um, maybe not nonprofits, but we're seeing this in the for-profit space where you don't want to have, you know, a giant lease on the books for a related entity or something like that. So that's something to keep in mind too. It's not necessarily all leases, it's long-term leases. And I would argue as an auditor, it's for material leases. So you don't need to be doing this for a, a $50 a month postage machine if you're a $10 million organization. It's just a waste of everybody's time. Important takeaway here is that it affects ratios, right? So if there's any financial covenants that you have in place based on liquidity and things like that, um, this could be impactful because you now have an asset and liability that are on the books. I know I'm I'm sort of running low on time here, so I'm going to skip through a lot of this. The liability, really, it's the present value of the future lease payments to be made. And the asset is the lease liability plus any other direct costs that were incurred initially, plus any incentives that are received. Really, your asset and liability should be close throughout the course of the lease term. Uh, they may differ by you know, thousands of dollars here and there, but they should mostly offset. I'm gonna skip through this. This is short-term leases here also. Uh, there are a lot more disclosures that are required now. You notice in your financial statements about this. Um, lease terms and conditions were always required, but now the lease cost, the amortization of the uh, ROU, right of use assets and the interest on liabilities the interest rates in place, they all have to be disclosed. Um, different charts about remaining term on the leases. It, it, it's just become like a one to two page disclosure now, whereas in the past it was probably a half a page. Lessor accounting is mostly the same. So again, if you're leasing out to somebody else for property and things like that, uh, you still have to really identify that the nature and the type of the lease is it sales type, direct financing or an operating lease. Um, but the accounting for it is basically the same because you already have the asset on your book. So it's not a huge difference than what it was in the past. Just a couple more pages to go here. This one probably doesn't apply to any of you, but it might. Uh, accounting for goodwill. So goodwill is the, the um, excess that you pay <clears throat> in a merger or something like that for uh, intangible assets that um, really can't be named or, or you know, valued independently, usually. Uh, so what happens here is you have to identify whether or not there's any impairments to the goodwill because it sits on your balance sheet as an asset. This eliminates and simplifies part of the goodwill impairment test. So really you're just comparing the fair value of a unit with its carrying amount. Something's on the books for $100,000 and its fair value is 50, then you have to write it down to the 50. Um, there's There used to be other steps in place that were more complicated, but this just simplifies that um, for organizations. It, I think I have two clients that have this in, in my, all my years here, so it's not a huge deal. Defined benefit plans also not common, but some of you may have this. 
uh, not a 401k defined benefit is defining how much you pay to beneficiaries over time based on their length of service and things like that. There's just some new disclosure requirements that have been added, nothing crazy here, and then some that were deleted. Usually this information comes from an actuary and usually your auditor should be on top of this because most of you are not preparing your own financial statements. Just know that this is something that's out there and you may see some changes to the disclosures for the DB plans. And then the last page, uh, LIBOR, another acronym, the London Interbank Offered Rate. A lot of um, debt instruments, you know, peg interest rates to LIBOR, but LIBOR is going bye-bye. It really is already effective June 30, 2023. I think it's still around. Um, there's reference rates that I think will be in effect through September of this year. Uh, but a lot of contracts and things like that were pegged to LIBOR and that was going away. Something to be aware of there. Um, shouldn't affect most of you either, really. Um, if there were receivables in place, you could adjust the effective interest rate going forward with whatever new rate replaces it. Leases, um, existing contracts are in place. Really not a big change there because using a historical discount rate that you had in place. Deriv derivatives and hedging, I, I really hope none of you are doing this or it applies to you, so I won't even talk about it. So this is something too to, to be on the lookout for. If you have something that is pegged based on LIBOR, whether it's a lease or a debt instrument or something like that, there may be some accounting or financial implications there. So really, in a nutshell, I spent a lot of time on contributions because I think I needed to. And the takeaway there is contribution versus exchange and then condition versus no condition, restriction, no constraint, no restriction. Yellow book uh, increased from 750 to a million dollars for next year, that's good. Uh, some new auditor um, inquiries that may be required for IT and things like that would affect you. Cecil is real now. Uh, take a look at your bad debt reserves. Make sure that they're based on history, not just what you think will go bad based on today's knowledge. It has to be sort of reflective and then prospective at the same time. But, uh, cloud computing, if you're entering into these arrangements, make sure that you're looking at that to see if any of those implementation costs can be capitalized, thrown on your books as an asset and not expensed. These you should already be doing, but if you're not, you should be. Uh, and, and reach out to your accountants or, or try to figure out how to do that yourselves. The rest, not really a huge deal. So I'm at 45 minutes and I'll, I'll shut my mouth and, and thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, stick around. The next session is going to be a panel um, that'll come on after me. I didn't look at the Q&A or the chat, but like I said, we'll get back to you on any that we didn't get to hit on today. If there's ever anything we can answer for any of you, reach out to us. Uh, we are here to be uh, your, your servants, really, in the nonprofit education for accounting and finance and anything else. So thank you. See you all soon.